Okay, well, I am super pumped for our guest today. Uh, she is not only helping us continue to celebrate Pride Month on the podcast, she's also the co-star of the iconic 90s series, Ready or Not! Ready. And if you don't remember, Ready or Not followed the lives of best friends, Amanda and Busy, as they tackled the difficulties of teenage life. Well, 23 years after the finale, Lonnie Ballard is joining us to talk about the series, A Possible Reboot! And what she's up to now, including singing and practicing dog Reiki. What? Please welcome Lonnie Ballard. Woo! <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Lonnie, I have so many friends that are excited for this interview because Ready or Not was iconic. And, and right before uh, we got on the call with you, I, I told a friend of mine who's straight and married with children uh, that we were going to talk to. And she's like, oh, my God, she was my secret crush growing up. Oh. And I bet you've heard that a lot. I, uh, yeah, I hear all sorts of things and I'm very flattered. That's very sweet. Um, <laughs> that I haven't heard though. That's one that I have not heard. A straight woman with kids saying that I was her, her crush before all of her, you know, <laughs> life happened. So that's, that's a cool one. <laughs> Well, she said you gave like, you know, because she was an offbeat kid, you know, artsy fartsy. And you kind of did give youth that weren't like Amanda an alternative uh, role model, kind of. Yeah. And I uh, totally agree with you. And a lot of people will say to me, you know, I really like, um, you know, I really related to your character a lot more than Amanda's because you were really real and really like sarcastic and authentic and stuff and I was like oh that's cool yeah I mean you know there's all types of people they make the world go round and opposites attract a lot of the time for friendships you know so yeah um, I mean Amanda and Busy just balanced each other out I think I think so but like set the record straight because it is pride month and growing up I kind of just assumed that Busy was a lesbian but I guess in the 90s that wouldn't have flown on tv so she was just a tomboy right yeah she was a tomboy but Interestingly enough, um, the series is actually based loosely around the creator, Elise, who was Amanda character and then her best friend, Busy. Um, so they ended up meeting, going for coffee. I think it was like 10 years after the show or something. And um, her friend told her that she was gay and she had no idea. So um, that's really cool because everyone thought Busy was gay. And like, I mean, she was, but it wasn't really talked about. So. It's, that was interesting. Just an interesting uh, experience. Yes. Do you think as the actor, like in your, you know, deep method, was Busy gay? Well, I'm gay. So. <laughs> well, I know, but <laughs> you're playing a character, Lonnie. It doesn't have to be I, real I life. Was, yeah, I mean, I don't, I personally as an actor didn't think too deeply about it. Um, I knew that Busy had this immense love for Amanda um but I don't think I went that far like personally or even as an actor it it, it didn't it didn't go to that level of like oh well busy's gay right how old were you friends right she had boyfriends she had Troy and she tried to date that Ryan Gosling character guy who was oh we'll get to that that. (laughs) (laughs) so I mean yeah it was no it didn't it didn't it wasn't in the forefront put it that way and how old were you when you were filming the series? 11 to 16. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot for an 11 to 16-year-old to think about, right? Yeah, and I didn't come out myself till like, around 18. So, like, fully come out. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Did you always know? Because me, as a fellow gay, like, I came out of the womb with a boa on. Like, I've always known. And so that's surprising for a lot of people that um, you can know that young. But I always did. Did you? Well, I knew that I loved my girl, like, my girlfriends. And I loved women. But I didn't, you know, but I didn't. But I loved men. And I had lots of boyfriends. And so I didn't. <sighs> I guess I just thought I just loved people, you know, but there was always this extra thing with the woman and the women. And, um, yeah, I didn't know till I knew. So fair enough. There you go. Do you think if ready or not was created today that busy maybe would be gay? Yes. Well, you'd even hesitate there. Yeah, I think so too. 
I really, really want it all to happen because I want to be a strong gay role model in this day and age. And, uh, you know, with the busy, obviously, character behind me. Um, so fingers crossed. We've run into a little bit of a hiccup here. So we're Oh, are you all are you hinting at the reboot? Is this what we're talking well, about now? <gasps> I didn't even have to ask, Lonnie. <laughs> Listen, we all want the reboot to happen. I'm telling you that right now. We all want it. Everyone is on board. Um, but we do have some hiccups and some stuff we have to now backtrack and, and find another approach. Um, wow. So we've been we've been set back. And um, I'm not giving up. You know, I know we got fans all around the world that want yeah. this to happen and we want it to happen. So I'm putting all my resources and my head, you know, putting my thinking cap on here and I'm going to try to do my best to, uh, to help this. Make do you think this is a case that a reboot, cause sometimes you hear about reboots and they just don't do well. I mean, I take a look at like the Connors and oh, that's so some, bad, I know. right. Even Will and Grace wasn't very good. Oh, do, I know. Careful. Careful. It wasn't the reboot. It just wasn't the same, right? Do you ever get scared that, you know, it's not going to be the same? Well, you know, I always look at life like if something's supposed to happen, it it will. Um, And there obviously is, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. So the show is was the show and it was incredible and it stands on its own and yeah obviously there is a chance that when or if the reboot does happen that it loses something although I don't think it will because I believe that where the characters are going to be now is an important important for the world to um, experience and to to be shown so um, I think it will be okay but I know exactly what you're saying because I've I've watched some of these and I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, you could say that even for the first seasons of shows like I, I'm thinking about we had Kirstie Alley on the podcast and she was talking about her sitcom Kirsty, which I was a huge fan of. And it was doing well. Right. And it only got one season and they canceled it. So a lot of the times in this business, there's no rhyme or reason why they cancel something, why they continue a show for 10 years. That's shit. Like we just don't know. Yeah. So you never know what's going to hit. I totally agree with you. And um, I'm kind of taken aback that uh, the network that it was presented to said no. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. It's been a bit of a hit for all of us. So um, like I said, if it's supposed to happen, it will. And um, I know fans want to see it. Um, So hopefully the energy out there will uh, get it going. Yeah. Can you give us a hint as to the plot of the reboot? I feel like I'm barking up the wrong tree because you've been very careful about giving anything away. But I'm curious because obviously Busy and Amanda are grownups now. Yeah. Will Will the reboot follow their lives or will it still be geared towards young people? Um, the idea in the development is that it's going to be um, family members of Busy and Amanda. Younger, oh. The younger girls. Um, not exactly sure how they're related in this moment, but it would be basically following the younger girls and then Busy and Amanda would be obviously supporting and in the show. Similar to what Connor, the Connors did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like the Connors, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's okay. I just, I just think that, you know, the shows, the full house was full house, right? Like it's just nothing will compare. Um, and ready or not's ready or not. And, and it happened and it was incredible and, and it, nothing will compare. Um, hopefully we will be able to create something that is just as wonderful and entertaining and important, you know, talking about important things. Cause that's one thing I, I really stand by with the show, just the way it dealt with issues, you know, in the way that, um, that it needed to. So and it did deal with a lot of issues. Like Ready or Not was very far ahead of its time when it comes to tackling social things like that. Like there are two episodes that stick out in my mind um, that kind of like shocked me as a child, but I needed it because I was young and horny and looking for answers. 
And it brought me those answers. So one of the episodes was when Busy and Amanda caught their, uh, was it a coach or a teacher or somebody kissing another man? Yeah, our karate teacher. Yes, the karate. And he had to like sit you down and talk mm-hmm. to you about what it meant to be gay. Mm-hmm. And that was, I think, the first time I ever saw it addressed on a children's show, like right in your face. And I really appreciated it. Yeah. And I remember even um, reading the script and um, other issues that we've dealt with, too. Just the scripts, just the way it was written, the way it was dealt with. It was, it was very tactful. It was very sensitive. Um, it wasn't like in your face. I mean, it was, but not in the way I'm, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't uh, enough that any of the conservative, like homophobic families at the time would have been terribly offended or, you know, scarred by that scene. Right. And this is important stuff to talk about, right? Like these are things that actually happen in the world and they're important to talk about. And sometimes you have to have the uncomfortable conversations and I'm, incredibly grateful that I was, be, you know, be able to be a part of, of, of a show that was, was able to influence people and help people along. So it's awesome. I always say we need more of those shows. Cause I feel like we kind of went away and I know some of them seemed a little cheesy back then. Like there was always that lesson at the end of a mm-hmm. show, you know, but that like helped shape some of us. And <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we've lost our way a little bit and we need shows like that to come back again. Yeah, no shit. Sorry for swearing, but like I oh, don't very want to much, swear away. <laughs> very much behind that sentiment, and I'm actually real sad at the state of TV right now and what I'm seeing and what shows are getting produced and picked up and put on air. Um, there, yeah, anyway, it's just a lot of. It's a lot no, of go of there, stress. go there, Lonnie. This is this, this is that kind of show. We want that dirt. Well, and I think we're watching a really pivotal moment right now where reality TV is we're gonna lose it because you know everyone's getting fired. These people aren't actors. These are real people <laughs> with real beliefs. Not all yeah. of them are great. Yeah. And I think we're slowly and reality is what took over television. I know, and it's sad because it's even though it's real, it's still scripted in a way, and it's just. It's like pulling the wool over people's eyes when there's like way more important things to right. discuss and p- portray and put out there. So, well, for reality, they're just not realistic. Like, you take a look at the Bachelor franchise, there's never been a gay bachelor, mm-hmm. there's only like one bachelor or bachelorette of color. Mm-hmm. When you see the whole cast, it's all these white people and like yep. the one token Asian, the one token, you know, Latino or Latina. Yep. And- the one token black person and it's like that's not a right that's so far from reality (laughs) I know and like you know with everything that's going on in the climate of the world um it's time to like you know pull the veil pull the veil get real put the real shit out there and not be afraid of it but from what I'm seeing in this moment it seems like the network is are still you know apprehensive or I don't really know Do you think it's because they're afraid? Like you mentioned fear, and I think that plays a part in the whole world right now. Like not just TV, but radio too. All the networks are afraid to take chances because we live in a cancel culture. And one thing goes wrong and the show's canceled. So everybody tries to play it safe. And I'm not sure that's the right idea. I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, you got to go for it. And the worst that happens, like, you know, Kirsty got canceled after one season but they went for it and it was successful for that season you know and um I think fear can hold you back in a lot of ways and and um you know I'm I'm not I don't I don't allow fear to hold me back personally and I live my life and I I attempt to be the best person that I can and um like I said I'm I'm in a sad state of what I see on TV and I would love to see a revolution happen, you know, where people aren't afraid to take risks and, you know, we're pushing the envelope and talking about the things that need to be talked about. I don't know. I don't know if the change will come, but I'm praying that it does. Me too. Um, The other episode that uh, shaped my young horny years was when busy with one of her boyfriends. um, I don't remember which one was in doing seven minutes in heaven or was it like, do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. And then there was like party. You were at the party. And then there was talk of touching a boob. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, oh, you can touch my boob and I'll touch yours. And I was all like totally scandalized, turned the volume down in my parents' basement, you know. <laughs> but I loved it. Yeah, that was a, that was, a, that was, um, you know, it's so funny, you know, hearing this because at the time, 
at the time that we filmed these episodes, it didn't feel like we were making that kind of impact, if that makes sense. Like, it didn't, it just felt like we were just talking about things and things that happened to kids and it just didn't it didn't I didn't realize the impact till I have conversations like this or people say you know oh my god that episode really helped me through this and so you know it's just amazing to hear these things so is there an episode that helped you get through anything and affected Hmm. your life in any way (laughs) uh I like I'm, how I can just hear her laugh, though. I can't see the face. So well, I don't I'm just, know if that's just an evil <laughs> laugh or, like, what's going on. No, 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 no. I was doing, like, a... <laughs> I was, like, thinking. I'm thinking. A thinking um, laugh. I'm thinking. We've got 65 episodes here to... Uh, right. To, to recall. Um, but they were very honest, right, while you're thinking. Like, I think that's why the seven minutes in heaven was awesome because that's what kids did do at parties, teenagers, you know, whether or not the parents want to believe it. So to put that on TV, it just seems like, you know, these days, like we were saying, networks would be way too scared to go there. Well, yeah. I mean, the only thing that really stands out for me uh, personally was just um, allowing myself to be more vulnerable as an actor. And that would have been in the episode Family Therapy, where our the whole Ramon family went for therapy. And um, Busy was always really, really, like, con- con- contracted and-, and not super emotional and didn't really get down to the healing and things that she needed to deal with. But in that episode, she really allowed herself to be honest with how she was feeling and allowed herself to be emotional. And uh, I do remember that day on set. And-, and it was a turning point for me as an actor, too, just to get into that reality of feeling those emotions that are really important to feel. Um, So, I mean, that stands out, but, but in general, just in general, being on this show, everything helped me to be the person that I am. Every experience, every person I met, every person I acted with, every line that I said, because busy was very close to me as a, as a, in person. So um, it wasn't super far fetched for me a lot of the time. Um, well, and it was, what's interesting is that you were at the same, you were the same age as your character that you played. Yeah, I mean. That well, doesn't I, always happen. Right. Yeah. No, no kidding. Um, I think I was a little bit, I think I was a little, I'm trying to think if I was older or younger by a little bit, but it doesn't matter. We were very right. close in age and very close in personality. So I didn't feel like I was acting too much, if that makes sense. And so a lot of this was like a personal experience that I was going through too. Even though I would stand on my mark and say my line and, you know, stand under the light and talk to other actors, it just still felt really like I was having a personal experience as well. So, yeah. Um, does Do you, Lonnie, like plaid as much as Busy does? <laughs> Actually, yeah, I do. I have about 10 plaid shirts in my closet. <laughs> she really a is token, good. A yeah. token lesbian shirt. When yeah. I, um, my mom also likes plaid shirts. I made a joke with her. I said, Mom, you sure you're not a lesbian because of the amount of plaid shirts? <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned the Ramones and group therapy. I forgot Busy's last name, but her, her first name was actually Elizabeth, was it not? Yes, yes it was. So Elizabeth Ramon, where did the nickname Busy come from? Well, I figured, kind of figured it out with Elise too, but it sort of is like Elizabeth, Lizzie, Liz, Biz, Busy. Like it's, okay. mm, we're not really 100% sure, but that's sort of the, the timeline of it. I get that. Like, you know, when you have pet names for someone you're dating and eventually like they morph into something weird. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I had an ex-boyfriend that we were both obsessed with, uh, Seinfeld, so he would call me Jerry. Like, you know, the way Elaine says it, like, Jerry, when she's mad. So he would <laughs> say that to me all the time, and then eventually it evolved to, like, Larry and then Gary, and it ended up just being that he would call me Gary, like, as if it was my name, <laughs> which it's not my name. And um, But I would answer to it, like, it became totally normal. So nicknames are so strange how they develop. Yeah, that's interesting story. Um, it's funny to hear because, like, I thought the busy thing was just really out there. But you know, hey, listen, sounds like other people have those um, those fun <laughs> things that happen. <laughs> I think it's a really cute name. I just think of Busy Phillips too. Like, that's her yeah. actual name, right? 
Yeah, so. she's cool. I like her. She's a cool cat. And a great song that we could all use to get through these days. Hold on. <laughs> no oh. kidding. Oh, that's Holy. Wilson Phillips. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? That's okay. <laughs> Listen, you know, Busy Phillips is cool, too. She was on yeah. that show. It was really good. It was with Freaks and Geeks. Yes. But oh, Cougar Town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was great. Well, one thing you guys have in common is you. she was a child actor, too, wasn't she? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was what was the, what was it like growing up? You know, because I had a friend who also was an actor and, you know, she would go months where she wouldn't be at school. Yeah. And it was always awkward. What was it like for you? It was tough because those are these were very much like formative kind of years. Right. Eleven to 16. Right. Um, and I went to an art school. So kids in the beginning were not very nice to me at all. Jealousy, probably. Um, right? Obviously, because I was not there a lot. And then when I would come back, I would get some special treatment or something. So, you know, the group of girls was like, well, we don't want you here. Go back to your TV show, you know. And I'm young and I'm sad now. So, um, but they really did try to get me to school as much as we could. But I mean, you know, with sometimes 16 hour days shooting, I would have a tutor on set. So it would be like, you know, light or rehearse the scene they would light it and then go back to school and write a test or write it you know the rest of my essay and then go back to film and go back so it was like you had to really decompartmentalize your brain you know to be like okay I'm shooting okay I'm in school okay I'm shooting okay I'm in school it was it's pretty wild for someone that young it it just shows that I'm brilliant really let's be honest (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but also as a teenager, you must have felt like, screw this, I'm already on TV, this is my goal, why do I need this crap? Kind of, I yeah. did have that mindset, and um, I actually ended up getting into Ryerson Theatre School, um, oh. and I went there for one year, and I had that exact attitude, Jesse. and I'll be honest with you, in hindsight, I don't think that was a great attitude to have, because I think as an actor... You can always learn more and you can always hone your craft and you can (laughs) always get better. But my attitude of like, well, I have my own TV shows. Like, I don't need to I don't need to run around like a monkey for three hours. Like, it's a waste (laughs) of my time. You know what I mean? Um, And she's not exaggerating. I went to Humber Theater School and you're absolutely right. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I just I just had that vibe. And so I didn't end up going back after after the year. But um, as now, you know, being where I'm at, I feel like maybe I uh, bit bit the horse's head or whatever that saying is, bit the tail before. I don't know. There's like a saying where you like. You put the cart before the horse? There you go. Sure. That works. (laughs) 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 But, you know, it's an interesting point because I once read an article on my quest for fame myself (laughs) that people can't mentally handle it before the age of like 30 or 25 when your brain's fully developed Uh, and you seem pretty well adjusted considering you got a taste of it at at, during those formative years when it could really mess you up hello Britney Spears well I know and I will definitely thank my parents thank you thank you thank you for putting um, a really good head on my shoulders and um, always supporting me and letting me, you know, fly and do what I was supposed to do at the time. And I also did a series before Ready or Not. I did um, a series for Owl TV called Frog, which was like a science show, a kid science show. So I did like 20 episodes of that even before I did Ready or Not. So I was I was doing TV like around 10, um, 10 years old. So, yeah, it's uh, it's wild, you know, looking back. Um, you and Ryan Gosling both because he was popping up on every show around that same time like I remember seeing him on Goosebumps Are You Afraid of the Dark yeah, yeah. Ready or Not yeah Breaker yeah. High yeah, yeah. And that he, was my favorite and he was like a nerd in that hot hot guys now like he's so hot now and I remember in Breaker High he played like the dorky friend well and that's what he played on Ready or Not he played the dorky friend yeah and um, he was dorky I'm telling you, I didn't even remember he was on my show until I decided to go online and just read about what people were writing about Ready or Not. And there was this thread about Ryan Gosling being on my show. And I'm like, what fucking show was, what show, what episode was this? (laughs) So I decided to click on the link and I was like, oh my God, it was that episode. Like I didn't even, he had no impact on me at the time. 
Like I was just like, he's just this like dorky, not confident, kind of shy, weird voice. Like he just And his hair, weird hair, long, hair was weird. super straight. Yeah, but like look at him now, eh? Holy oh. <laughs> But, you know, like, I'm a lesbian, like, but, like, holy, you know? <laughs> you mentioned, like, you didn't think that he was going to necessarily be, like, a huge star. I mean, you never do. But no. looking back, he was booking a lot of gigs back then. So I guess the writing was kind of on the wall, because who else got so many shows? Like, he was on everything. I know. You know, you just never know. And uh, never who know. are we to judge anyway, right? Like, <laughs> Do you general. think that that's, like, based on luck or... Do you think that it is actually based on talent when you do finally succeed? Because, you know, I find that a lot of actors are very talented. However, right. there's only a handful that make it to that I level. Think, well, I uh, <laughs> it's an interesting question because um, I'm still here as a struggling actress. Right. <laughs> um, so I don't, never ends. I don't know. It, it does never end unless you end it, unless you say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Um I think he had something and they just capitalized on it. Like right. he had a really interesting voice and he had a really interesting kind of charm, like understated charm that if you watch him when he was younger, you can see where that could have blossomed or that could have been, you know, taken and made into what he is now. Right. So I think that someone just saw something and then just that was I don't know his whole history of like filmography or projects but that's how it happens sometimes I mean Sarah Pauly um, didn't work after Road to Avonlea for eight years and then she got the lead in Adam McGoyan's Go the movie Go and that was it again so right as my dad says just keep plugging along and you just never know like well look at Jane time, Lynch Right. I just yep. finished reading Jane Lynch's uh, and her big break didn't come till she was nearly 50. Yeah. So you got to just keep on keeping on. Yeah. Like if you're, you know, I've had my ups and downs with the business for sure. And I've thought about quitting and um, but something in me just keeps hanging in. And, uh, you know, I am working on my own music, my own album right now. I sing and play drums. So. Um, that's basically the forefront of my focus, but I do still have uh, my toe dipped in the acting world. And uh, if it's so let it will be. Tell us more about this singing because you've done a lot of hip hop too. And like knowing Busy and, and Long, <laughs> I don't know you very well, but when I read that, I was like, hip hop, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, my mom's, you know, my mom uh, sings and plays piano. My dad sings and plays guitar. His influencers are like a country rock and my mom's R&B pop soul. So um, I've always grown up with uh, with that kind of uh, influence. My own stuff is going to be um, like pop, soul, R&B kind of thing. Um, so that's, yeah, that's <laughs> hip hop. Yeah, I just ended up cl um, helping out a couple of hip hop artists that I had uh, that had somehow we connected. I don't even know how, but I sang on, on a couple of their tunes. Um, but I love hip hop. Do you I perform by yourself like, when you what, sing? What? Are you are you a solo performer or are you part of a group? Um, no, it will be just me. And obviously I'll have like a band of some kind or some players. But at this point, Jesse, I don't know what, I don't know. I'm going to be doing it in my living room, I guess, because <laughs> uh, the sad, sad state of live music Um it just crushed. It just like breaks my heart, to be honest. You know what though? The drive-in, the drive-through, uh, or the drive-in concerts are becoming a thing. Garth Brooks just signed up to do like a ton of them in the U.S. Oh, really? Yeah. So I feel like they're onto something with that. All those drive-in movie theaters that were shut down, you know, not too long ago, are probably going to pop back open, and maybe that's what we'll see is just a different experience. Well, I mean, I, I just, I, I really hope that's the truth. And I, I hope that, um, you know, <laughs> the live music scene, you know, opens back up because people need that. We need concerts. We need live music. We need singing. We need, we need that. We need that for our souls. Um, you know, I read something yesterday about this thing with the child care centers that are reopening on Friday and they're not going to allow singing or something I read, like no singing and no plush toys. And I'm just like, <laughs> what? Like what has God. happened? What has happened? 
You know, I, yeah, I've read some of the measures that they're taking at schools and stuff. And I go, you're not going to be able to tell little kids to do this. Like, I know. They, they can't wrap their head around it, guys. Like, like I know. if it's it dangerous, don't send them. Yeah, I get it. I know. <laughs> anyway, we won't, we won't really talk on that. But um, yeah. I'm just really hoping that the live music um, makes, a, makes a comeback here. So... Yeah, right. that could be a good thing. How are you keeping busy in quarantine, um, practicing Reiki on your dog? Well, I've been a Reiki master now for, I'd say, about four years. And I initially practiced just on humans. Um, but I then uh, studied with an animal communicator in Arizona. And um, I became an animal Reiki practitioner. So I did it for a little bit. Um, I think people were, uh, you know, they were curious, but they didn't really want to follow through. And I'm not the type of person that's going to be like calling people and badgering people. You know, if you want to come to me for my services, then uh, we can talk more about it. I haven't really been doing the Reiki thing that much. For me personally, keeping busy, I'm, uh, I'm actually doing grocery delivery during the day. So that's really cool. I am really happy that I can get out there and help people get their food and get their groceries. That's um, great. And still do something with my time. I'm not the type of person that can just sit and do nothing. So, um, yeah, I'm really grateful that I'm able to do that. And uh, I have my nights free, which is amazing. I used to serve full-time nights. So this is like a whole new world for me, and, uh, and I'm really enjoying it. So somehow I'm finding the silver lining in the chaos, I guess. I guess so. Um, that's good. That's amazing. Like going back to what I was saying as a child star, you could consider yourself far above doing something like grocery delivery. So it's really cool to see that you re recognize it's not um, a job that should be looked down on at all, especially right now. No, I don't think any job should be looked down on. Right. And, and you know, if, if this quarantine's showing us anything, it's that all jobs are important from the janitor to the CEO and everybody has their place in the world. And, you know, if we all just work together a lot more and accepted everybody a lot more, then things I feel would just be a lot better. Right. So I just keep saying my prayers. And like I said, I do my best to go out there every day and just make people smile and give the good vibes. And, uh, yeah. Just continue to do your part. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Right. <laughs> But the reason I asked about the dog Reiki is because I've got two adorable chihuahuas and sometimes I wish I could communicate with them better. And so how do you know if Reiki works on a dog? Because they can't tell you, oh, my wrist feels better. Well, it's interesting because animals are super sensitive to energy, right? So even more sensitive than humans. Um, I, did an anim I did an animal Reiki treatment once and the dog, I just basically opened my hands. I'm just a channel for the universal energy that already exists in the planet, right? So I'm just I'm just a conduit. And um, the dog came up to me, sniffed my hands, and then went into the corner and curled up and fell asleep for half an hour. <laughs> so obviously the owner's like, well, how do I know that, you know, the Reiki did anything? But then the next day she was telling me like, oh, he's not as, he was, he's not as crazy towards his brother and he's, his whole temperament has, you know, calmed down a bit. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so, you know, I always say Reiki goes where it needs to go. Um, and it's not so specific, right? Like if someone said to me, oh, my dog is having knee problems. Can you come and do Reiki and heal my dog? Well, the Reiki energy will go where it needs to go, which it acts as a balancer for the chakras, basically, which relate to meridians and organs and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. It's you cool. don't really know unless you kind of know, you know, you, you notice, you'll notice a little bit of a difference. You know, I've only had one Reiki experience myself and it was funny enough on set when this was in 2007, I was filming a pilot for a Canadian show called Fearless and it was like an early reality show and the premise was me like super gay goes around with a single mom who was in her 50s and does all these like crazy stunts like bungee jumping and white water rafting. And the, the point was like two people who wouldn't normally do these things are like breaking out of their comfort zone. And of course I really hurt myself white water rafting. I like sprained my wrist. Ooh. And one of the producers was a Reiki master and she was like, oh, let me just, you know, say a spell at your wrist. And I was like, oh, please. <laughs> This say isn't a gonna spell. Work. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dumbing it down, but I, I I'm trying to be funny and I shouldn't be with this because I know it's a very serious thing. But the point is, I didn't believe it. I was like, I thought it was hocus pocus, witchy stuff. 
but it worked. And right? all of a sudden my wrist felt so much better. And then I became like an advocate for Reiki and I was telling other people about it who gave me then the, oh yay, hocus pocus response. But it's like, once you experience it, you see it, it does work. Well, even if you don't believe something, it'll, it can still work. Right. right? It did but, for me. But sometimes having that extra belief and having the intention of wanting to believe also helps to have it work too. Right. So it's, I mean, Reiki, like I said, it exists. The energy exists. So you can not believe it, but then if you have that experience, that what you did have that experience, then now you're a believer. That's right. <laughs> you know, I haven't met a lot of people that, that have tried it that deny that it works. And, you know, I ha I've had a few friends that were this, just like Jesse, very much doubtful about whether it works or not. And they were like, and they're like, I don't believe in a lot of hocus pocus stuff like that. They're like, no crystals, no essential oils. They're like, you know, and they went for sessions and now they're, they're hooked. Well, that's awesome. Like I said, mm -hmm. it speaks for itself. So it's, it's not anything that anybody needs to defend. And everybody's entitled to their own opinion about anything anyway. Um, but uh, I know it works. And uh, I'm really happy that it is a part of my life. And I use it on my animals and myself and anybody that really that I come across that wants it. Like, you know, it's just, it's theirs. So harness the power. Harness the power. Just like the power of Ready or Not has to calm people down in quarantine. I don't know right. if you found this blog, um, but recently, this was posted a couple weeks ago, somebody said they've been, there's 11 episodes of Ready or Not that like help calm your anxiety down if you're feeling stressed out. Have you read this? I feel like I did or skimmed through it. Can you send that to me actually? Yeah, again? I will. Yeah. It's so cool because I have two friends that were excited for this interview and, um, she had been telling me she was actually watching Ready or Not at the, when quarantine started, probably because she'd watched everything else on Netflix. But it's like, yeah, right. why not revisit the classics? And she said it made her feel so much better. Like, I don't know what that is. Is it nostalgia? It reminds you of a simpler time. Um, but I thought that was cool. I feel like that's exactly probably what it is. It brings you back to remembering where you were at maybe when you were watching the show or when the show was happening. And it was a simpler time. It was 1000% a simpler time and it just feels like everything's just so fucked up that uh, you need something to grab onto to like bring you back in a way, you know, bring you yeah. back to some sense of just normalcy or like, you know, calmness, I guess, you know. Familiarity is very comforting when everything else is not so familiar around you. Amen. Right. Amen. Kind of like snacks in quarantine. What are you eating in quarantine, Lonnie? <laughs> yeah. I'm not eating. What am I not eating? I'm in grocery stores every single day. Oh. I'm like, to be honest, before I was doing this, I was the type of person that would just very, very simple kind of, you know, the fresh stuff. And now I'm just into all sorts of shit, Jesse. Like I tried lose roast beef like pre-cooked roast beef with the sauce. Like I'm into it all, man. I'm into like digestive cookies like all sorts <laughs> of shit <laughs> you gotta try the pulled pork the loose pulled pork orange oh. package it's amazing okay done well, I'm eating everything I'm literally eating everything and thank god I'm not gaining any weight but like I do have to be add more fresh greens and stuff for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah you bitch for not gaining weight you're the only one in quarantine I think that's probably I I'm very lucky I mean I maybe I gained a little bit but we're not really going to talk about it so. okay <laughs> <laughs> well everybody should follow you on social media uh not just because you're fabulous but I actually love the positive messages that you're sharing um to help everybody get through this time one of them that stuck out to me was you posted a meme that said good things can still happen in the middle of chaos absolutely and I thought that was a really important message for people to hear because a lot of our world is doom and gloom right now, but it doesn't mean you're not allowed to be happy or that you're not allowed to have moments where you're silly. Absolutely. And I'm like the type of person, like always just try to look for the silver lining or the glimmer of, you know, happiness in amidst the chaos. And, you know, for me, it starts with being grateful just being really grateful all the time for everything that I have and everything that I've had and everything that I'm going to have. And that's, that's as simple as it is. But why are you so happy all the time, Lonnie? Well, I'm grateful. Yeah. I, I don't have any, anything else that I can offer. 
Um, you know, times are tough, but times have always been tough in a way. You know, people have always been struggling. There's always been struggles. It's just how you kind of want to frame it and, and you know, what color you want to put over top of it. So, but yeah, follow me on social media, everybody. I post inspirational stuff all the time. It's good, good times. She does. What is your handle on Instagram? Uh, it's Lonnie B5. Lonnie B5. I feel like that could be like, if you do start a band, that could be your band name. Lonnie B5? <laughs> yeah. I love it. I'm into it. I'll give you 5%, okay? Oh, <laughs> you just made a deal with the devil. I know, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Look out, Chris Jenner. Me and Lonnie are coming. <laughs> Well, Lonnie Billard, I hope the reboot happens. Um, if it does, you'll have to come back on the show and talk about it when you can reveal some more details. Okay, that sounds like a plan. All right, Lonnie Billard, cheers. I had cheers. a great time, guys. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>